welcome everybody to this week's Freightonomics, where we discuss the macroeconomic environment and combine it with our freight market data uh, so that you can go about your week managing your supply chain, your transportation, et cetera, et cetera. And I am Zach Strickland, head of freight market intelligence here with, as always, chief economist Anthony Smith, here to help you work through this crazy, confusing world. Anthony. <laughs> a lot of craziness, a lot of confusingness. And we, if you're watching live right now, we appreciate it because we know we used to be at noon, but we're now at 11.30 Eastern Standard Time on your Thursday mornings, depending on where you are in the world on the U.S. Um, but if you're watching us now in your live, we appreciate it. If you're on LinkedIn, thank you so much. I'll be looking down from time to time because if you want to join in on the conversation, ask a question, make a point, anything whatsoever, you can do that on LinkedIn and you can become a part of the show. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's been kind of a tough go here lately, for, especially for the, the people that are transporting the goods. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because there's not, a, there's not as many goods being transported, Anthony. Um, yeah. There's a <laughs> big, well, there's not as many. And I think the ability to spend on goods is also really being hampered as well. I mean, of course, you look at a lot of folks that say, hey, we're in a good spot right now for the economy. Look at the job opening summer. But the hiring has been slowing down the entire year for the most part. At, on, when you look at the overall trend, I think there's been two bump ups in the entire year of 2022 for overall hiring. It's been trending downwards. Um, the savings rate now at the lowest level, and I think around 15 or so years, I think the last time it was this low. But why and, would they save, Anthony? They're not no. paying you for it. No. <laughs> there, there's no reason to yeah. save. And so a lot of folks are going to be living right now paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. And that's not, you know, you're saying, hey, maybe lower income, but it's middle class and upper income earners as well yeah. that are also living pay to, paycheck to paycheck. And so really utilizing a lot of that credit card, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and you know, I read an article this morning about the, in the Wall Street Journal about uh, how the big banks really aren't paying you to save anything. And it's because the deposits are still relatively high for them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, look into looking at some of these high yield uh, savings uh, situations if you do have the cash. I think that's a pro, pro financial tip <laughs> for your, for your consumer life. So you can have more money to spend on freight. <laughs> oh, exactly. 100%. But when we're looking at that, I mean, that's the other big thing. So it's not just consumers that aren't really spending as much. I mean, when we're looking at what's happening upstream, we're starting to see some really distinct trends happening there as well. We'll get into a little bit later, but of course we're looking at manufacturing, looking at the ISM PMI, the purchasing managers index. We saw contraction for the first time in quite some time since the midst of the pandemic within manufacturing. We're seeing new orders come down. We're seeing the backlogs get cleared out, really showing that there is a shift happening upstream as well. Yeah, we, we, we of course, have had a couple of uh, shows here recently talking about this whiplash <laughs> uh, effect. In the, in the manufacturing, industrial sector, LTL, we're going to talk about that here shortly, having a delayed, lagged, you know, the automotive sector also yeah. having a relatively lagged kind of backlog clearing event. You know, that we saw the same thing happening on the maritime side where all this container congestion that was inhibiting the service and, and all that, it, it took a while, yeah. you know, to kind of catch up to the rest of the uh, environment. And I think that's what's happening with a lot of our macroeconomic figures, Anthony, is that we're seeing a slow, like the labor numbers are slow to respond. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this before. Uh, the labor markets typically are the last thing that get hit because if you think about it in the nature of your own business, What's the last thing you do? You go, oh, I need to go clear those those postings. Yeah, <laughs> you know when you have time to go clear it. Oh, and that's a big. That's another big point. It's like just because there's so many job openings doesn't yeah. mean that they're eligible jobs. Doesn't mean that they're just actively hiring. I've heard stories and stories. Of course, I can't use anecdotal evidence as yeah. overall evidence, but of so many people that are like, yeah, I've been applying everywhere. I've sent out over 200 applications over the last three months and nothing. But um, I mean, when you're looking at what's happening in the job situation, that's really one area where, of course, we look at initial jobs claims. It's a weekly measure. It bumped up this, this morning. Um, it's a volatile measure, but it's more high frequency than we're going to see with job openings when, right. with the unemployment rate, some of the other ones. But that's one of the areas where it can shift very, very quickly. Of course, we saw it at the beginning of the pandemic, but even before then, in other times of uncertainty or other recessions, we can see an upward movement of over 30,000 um, initial jobs claims within a week. And so even though it's still in that mid 200,000s range, a sudden spike up is not out of the question. Yeah. And, uh, you know, here in a few weeks, we'll probably have like a year in <laughs> uh, review. Also looking forward show on, on here to, uh, to cover some of that stuff. So let's, 
Let's let's bring ourselves back into the now. Uh, let's talk <laughs> about that freight market. Anthony, you want to do, oh, do our market in two? And market in two. Get everybody what they. Uh, this is what they came for, Zach. What they, what they need for let's their freight get it market. Going in Analytics. three, two, one. Ding ding. All right, this is the chart of the week, and I don't mean that in the way that I wrote an article (laughs) for it, but maybe I will. Uh, The NTI, uh, National Truckload Index, combined with the OTRI, Outbound Tender Rejection Index. So NTI, of course, it's all the spot rates. It includes fuel uh, in this version of it. Uh, Took a bump, uh, and it lasted throughout the last week. So spot rates took a little bit of an increase. However, this is not pervasive. I had to do a little research here because the OTRI, which measures the contract rate compliance here, uh, on the floor, we just dropped below 4% for the second time of the year and to the lowest point uh, of the year, 3.95%. So that means that carriers are staying very compliant with their shippers. They're covering everything that the shippers are essentially sending them and covering under contract rates. Makes sense. Why is the spot rate going up? Well, Let's go to the next chart here. Uh, one of the reasons is it's Pacific Northwest. Uh, the, it's, it's finally, it's time of the year where we see a lot of the harvests and a lot of the uh, Christmas trees going out. This is the Portland uh, to Stockton, Northern California spot rate spiking up. And I, I did a, a little research. Several of the Pacific Northwest lanes have huge spikes in them, like, like you're seeing right here. Uh, rate per mile is going through the roof. A lot of dispersion, though, doesn't mean that. So if you look at that confidence score on this chart, it's relatively low. That means there's a big dispersion of examples. So you're going to have really low rates and really high rates. But overall, the average moving up higher faster. Uh, let's go to the next chart here. I need to point out that the fuel situation is still extremely oh, weird. Uh, the retail price and the green staying relatively sticky to high level, while the wholesale price or the rack price and that white line dropping faster than the retail price, pushing the fuel spread hot to its highest point in history, uh, over uh, $2.14 per gallon. Last chart uh, here, OTVI demand showing really flat lining, so we're holding steady heading into the Christmas holiday, but I think it's going to fall afterwards. So, Zach, <laughs> once again, amazing. But let's talk about that. So that OTVI, can we, yeah. if we can pull that one up again. Um, when we're looking at um, this year compared to last year and the year mm-hmm. before, what's going to be some things that stick out to you? <sighs> so th- this this right here, this chart, yeah. this is this is... Everybody that has sonar should start their day with this guy. (laughs) This is the one that's going to give you the fastest uh, indication of any dynamic changes. You know, there's there is some optimism in the future, not with myself necessarily on the (laughs) demand side, and maybe not with you. I don't know uh, about demand side recovery, uh, especially in freight. I don't see it. Uh, I think this is going to get a little nasty coming Mm -hmm. into 2023. Because what we've seen throughout most of the year, that white line is the current year. You've got the pandemic year start in blue, where you see that bounce in March, where everybody bought toilet paper right. and it shoots up. Then you see 2021, which was stable uh, at a very high elevated level. Uh, and until March this year, the white line, we didn't really see any significant shifts. We've been stair-stepping down now, uh, October and November both had pretty significant drops. And that's not, like October, yes, it can happen. November, not really. Yeah. Uh, not to the level that you see it here. The holiday has an impact. But my takeaway here is that we're going to go below 2019 and 2023. Uh, and because 2019 actually at the end of the year was looking like it was things were starting to kind of recover out yeah. of this slower period of time. We were seeing some potential signs of growth, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't see any reason to think that that index right there will take any significant upward turns, sp- especially as we enter the slowest period uh, for freight and the economy, uh, especially for goods demand in January. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, at first I was like, wow, that's quite the call, but then I started thinking about okay, what are some of the catalysts that would really start to pull forward a lot of goods demand, either upstream or downstream? And I can't really place my finger on any type of thing unless it's like another type of black swan event. But when we're looking at this, I mean, the type of black swan events that I'm really kind of starting to think about aren't really demand inducing. It's almost like demand destruction from some of the black swan events that I'm starting to look at, you know, just coming from a financial standpoint, we're looking at um, uh, foreign exchange swaps, things like that. And so we're looking at those aspects. I definitely see why you have those expectations. The other big thing is 
the capacity. We're looking at yeah. Otri. That's been weak as well. Yeah, it's very weak. And, and you know, Craig and I discussed this on our webinar earlier in the week about how demand's falling, mm -hmm. but we haven't seen significant, and this is anecdotally, we don't have strong, uh, you know, consistent data around this figure, but the exits have not happened as significantly as we saw in 2019. That was a supply side correction event. Uh, we have not had that yet. Yeah. So from a capacity standpoint, that could be the thing. And that's what a lot of these larger fleets, larger carriers are, are kind of banking on to provide some support on the rate side about mid to late 2023. Possibly, yeah. but a lot of that's going to be driven into consolidation. So we're not going to see a reduction in overall capacity. We're going to see a reduction in competitive units, which is a slow thing to occur in the marketplace. And it's, I don't think it's going to make a sharp uptick on rates uh, at all next year. And, and transitioning from that, I mean, um, we have a really good article um, from Alan Adler yeah. in our news onomics section yeah. here, mm -hmm. um, talking about class eight truck orders, nowhere to go but down. Yeah, we, we saw that we talked about this uh, a few months ago where we saw record uh, class eight orders. Yeah. And, and this is a very nuanced situation because you have people that haven't been able to order. Uh, the OEMs actually canceled a ton of orders last year because they couldn't produce them. They overcommitted. And then they were like, sorry, guys, we can't give you the trucks. So what happened is, is all this replacement cycles got pushed into this year. And then they just basically stacked up over time yeah. and said, all right, equipment aging, it's costing us a ton of money in maintenance. Now all of a sudden, they all placed their orders at once, seasonally speaking, in uh, September and August. And uh, we saw this huge spike. And we're, sorry, we're starting to see them sequentially come down. And so when we're looking at that, I, I mean... That kind of feeds into the other part. I'm sorry, just got some more LinkedIn comments here. Mm -hmm. That feeds into some of the other parts about around the expectations going into 2023 and that consolidation. Um, when we're looking at what's going on with these Class 8 truck orders, are we really going to expect um, that a lot of that's going to go to replacing aging equipment, like you said earlier, yeah. or really is this really going to add any more capacity onto the roads? Yeah, the OEM, oh, the, these orders are very biased towards the larger fleets. Gotcha. So it's going to be very replenishment oriented, a, a very replacement cycle oriented process. Um, and I don't think we're going to necessarily add capacity, but it's, it, I, don't, I don't think it's a sign that we're going to see all these drivers and, and trucks show up next year. So I think all the signs are there that we're going to see another capacity reduction event. Um, and it's not necessarily going to be, it's not going to result in necessarily spiking rates. <laughs> so yeah. don't hold your breath on that one. This is really just kind of a correction to a situation that is now over. <laughs> yeah. And on to our, our next story, Zach. This one, of course, we it, it took our news cycle <laughs> by storm yeah. over the last few weeks. And now we're talking about it in a little bit of a different life, but Norfolk Southern moving away from furloughs to help improve labor relations. Yeah, so I hate, hate, hate furloughs. Yeah. <laughs> um, th this is, I mean, they're, they're good. They're better than layoffs. Don't get me wrong, but I hate furloughs. This is a uh, not great for the employee. <laughs> and of course, the rail... Uh, situation is not great on the labor side. So we have an activist investor really pressing Norfolk so they're not to uh, use furloughs. Um, seasonally speaking, furloughs are very common throughout transportation. And it's kind of a way to kind of keep the doors open during down cycles. However, furloughs, in my opinion, a lot of times are overused in the winter uh, months when freight demand reduces. My question to a lot of operators, how can you not build that into your budget? <laughs> yeah. Winter comes every year, and freight demand sinks, except for the pandemic era, every year. Now, this is slightly unique. Coming out of the overheated economy like we've just had, I think furloughs are, are fine. But in general, furloughs are kind of a questionable practice, in my mind, as a repetitive thing. <laughs> now, do you think this comes at a interesting time, just where we saw so much um, spotlight on the rail overall? Absolutely. This is a total, like, I mean... Like, hey, guys, like the service on the rail is not great right now, uh, even though demand has shrunk. <laughs> uh, so they're basically saying, how can we gain market share? The Norfolk Southern President, Alan Shaw, basically said, 
you know, two years later, we still have about 25% of our crew locations that are understaffed in a down cycle. And then they cannot uh, expect to gain market share from the trucks. Yeah. If they're serv- if coming into this down cycle, they can't service anybody. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it, I, I get it. And furloughs for sure aren't going to help their situation with their labor relations. You want your employees to be happy. What it does is you, you basically don't get, you get a certain amount of money and you have a job. However, why would you get 25% of your salary for the next three to four months? Like if you could handle that, right. you know, it, and most of these people not, they can't. Yeah. So they have to go get another job and then it turns into another career path. Right. So that's what the activist investor is basically trying to hedge against is saying, listen, we don't want these people to leave because we're already understaffed. Right. Why would we do this? <laughs> and I think that drives home for this point that was mentioned in the article. We were all unprepared in the last two years with a sudden down drawdown and demand and then sudden resurgence in freight. At the same time, labor force participation rates continued to decline. And when it came to rebuild our ranks, recall and recall our furloughed employees, we couldn't get enough people. And I think that also goes down to, of course, the macroeconomy. We look at the participation rate, not quite where it was, but also looking at the demographics within the economy. We talk about it all the time. We, we used to talk about it all the time at the beginning of 2022. Um, and we're looking at, of course, unfortunately, fewer women in the workplace. We're looking at baby boomers exiting the workforce as well. This, I think, is definitely an industry that's going to be very much focused on some of the older uh, generations in there that are just saying, you know what, I'm Absolutely. getting out. And so it's going to be hard to replace a lot of these skilled laborers that are choosing to exit. And that's the key, skilled labor. So yeah. like, this is a specialized industry. So it's not like you can go find somebody off the side of the street and expect them just to walk in uh, and do some, you know, tap on a keyboard and all of a sudden they're in. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and that's something that a lot of people discount is when you go through these periods of, you know, low demand, low cycle economically, you really have to consider your labor force, you know, like, it's very expensive to replace experience. <laughs> and when you do this, and this is what the activist investor, and I hate the term activist investor because it implies <laughs> altruism to an extent, and that's not the case most of the time. Um, it, it, it's very expensive to handle any kind of demand shift higher when things start to ramp back up, especially when you lose. You know, this is something that a lot of companies dealt with during the pandemic. They right. lost a ton of experience during their rate resignation. Right. Think about what that means moving forward. <laughs> Yeah, I think when we're looking at what companies are doing now, and I think that they'll be a lot more hesitant to lay off just because of what they went through. And so I think that almost puts a lot of companies in a much worse position, not just talking about this industry, but looking at the overall macro economy. You're looking at companies that are now going to be scared to lay off Mm -hmm. from some instances. And so they'll hold on to some employees a little bit longer. And that's going to even kind of put them into a worse financial position, potentially. Um, A lot of companies are already going to be in a bad financial position because we're looking at, of course, producers and shippers of goods um, that are now having to discount a lot of the goods just to keep it moving and pushing. That's going to really draw down their margins. And so if you're looking at margins really starting to get hit, then you're holding on to labor a little bit longer than you should because you're scared of being able to replenish your ranks a little bit later on, that's going to really spell for a lot of trouble potentially going into 2023. Yeah. And, and of course, yeah, I mean, I can't iterate enough. I mean, a lot of companies take this advantage uh, or take the time of, you know, to basically clean out some stuff that maybe wasn't working, uh, you know, some more experimental, uh, situations that they need to clean out. Tech has this a lot. Um, so this is where they cut off some of the projects that maybe their lifespan was near its end. And, and that, that happens. But general furloughs, layoffs for people that have been around for a long time, it's just, it really, you know, you know I get it during the beginning of the pandemic, a lot yeah. of uncertainty. Companies had to keep their lights on however they could. Now is also kind of one of those weird times. It's like, what do we do? Except every indicator we have is that this is going to be a relatively long downward trend. Uh, we have forward. a quick comment here. Johnny Carbajal on LinkedIn. Appreciate you joining on the conversation. He said, only the strongest will rise and survive it. Happened every seven years. I was a victim on the 2007 recession. So that kind of reminds me of just how how much experience really means within this industry, Mm -hmm. especially as um, when you look at, you know, the drivers Mm -hmm. aspects of it, how much that experience really means to just kind of being able to weather some of these down markets for sure. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, let's move on to the next story because this is, you know, we miss Zach Rogers. He is, of course, teaching <laughs> and doing uh, the Lord's work out there in Colorado State. But the LMI came out, Anthony, and everything basically says uh, down cycle for freight. Uh, capacity up, uh, prices, sharpest rate of contraction in November uh, yet. So it's basically, we are, I think we're, it's a foregone conclusion. Uh, trucking for sure is in a down cycle and the LMI is basically saying, yeah, we're definitely here. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of, um, I think interesting points here that we saw in the LMI. So real quick at a glance, um, the LMI is similar to the PMI where anything under 50 is indicative of contraction. Anything below above 50 is indicative of expansion within the logistics industry. So within the LMI overall, we have a reading of 53.6. So it's still growing, but growing at a slower pace because it was at 57.5 the month before. Um, we're looking at some of the biggest movers and significant trends in this month's LMI. We saw that the inventory levels number is now at a 54.8. This is down 10.7 percentage points from the previous month. So we are starting to see that there's a drawdown, but that doesn't mean that inventory costs are now below 50. No, inventory costs are still very much elevated at a 73.4. So that's down from the 80 percentage point reading before, but still very much high, still growing. Um, warehouse capacity is still contracting, is still below 50 at a 46.8. But as you mentioned earlier, one of the biggest ones that's really um, showing down this downshift in the market right now is transportation prices now at, uh, this is stunning, Zach, 37.4. Uh, um, for transportation prices. This it's is deep down from, contraction. <laughs> and deep contraction here. This I think this would classify as significant. And this is November. Or, yeah. or no, this is this is for November. This correct? is for November. Yeah. So November is typically not a contractionary price period. Right. Um, and we saw it in the OTVI. Demand fell off. Uh, but spot rates at the end of November started to creep back higher, but that's for the what we think is a very targeted direct to spot market uh, situation. So yeah. L LMI, the Logistics Managers Index, has, you know, I think if you remove the warehousing and inventory mm -hmm. component, that would all be below 50, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and and one of the things that uh, Dr. Zach Rogers and I, we're going to try to get him on next week, mm -hmm. um, he's also breaks down, of course, um, expectations at current, and then also now he's starting to break down early versus late in the month. And he says the responses this month were generally consistent between early November and late November, mm -hmm. showing that there was no shift or shift starting to kind of build out going into December. So that's also pretty significant here that's saying that, hey, there's likely a trend building into December as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely look forward. Hopefully he can join us next week. So last but not least, uh, last story, but it's also kind of the industrial update here. Um, industrial, Old Dominion Arc Vest, log November tonnage declines. Todd Maiden writes this article. Please check it out for sure. Uh, this was kind of our last holdout in freight. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, ha we had the small fleets, small carriers, spot heavy uh, carriers feel it early on in the year. Large fleets started to feel it probably early fourth quarter, late third quarter. And now LTL is finally joining the uh, the bunch here. Starting to feel some monthly tonnage declines, year over year declines. And it's uh, it's something else to see. Like SIA reported tonnage uh, was down 7% year over year in November, following a 3% decline in October, revising guidance downward for next year. And a lot of the LTL cares seemingly we're taken off guard by this. We've been talking about this for yeah. how long now? Uh, the, the, it's coming. Like, yeah. LTL feels these things. I was in the LTL industry. You're buffered to an extent from trucking volumes. Uh, you know, you don't have the volatility there that you have in the truckload department. But it comes due. Right. <laughs> Payment comes due. And it's kind of like the interest rate increases that, you know, the Fed's doing. Eventually they will take hold. Uh, just be, We talked about inflation mm -hmm. before it happened. Yeah. It may not happen. We're so used to this constant state of information. Like we're, we get this super fast uh, information coming at us and we think, okay, here, here it is. And we brace and we brace and nothing happens. And we're like, ah, oh, we're fine. And yeah. then whap, 
And that's oh. what's happened to LTL. Yeah. And, and I think when our beginning coverage of inflation it was that we were saying like, hey, there is inflation, but it's hitting other aspects right now. Yep. One of the first things that we're saying that it was hitting was some assets. So looking at, of course, run up on game stock or mm-hmm. cryptocurrencies. NFTs were a huge thing at one point in time. And then it transferred into other aspects. Right now, upstream, we're looking at a, a contract starting to happen with new orders. Yep. And we also were talking about at one point in time, that new orders are just orders and those orders can get canceled. And then after those orders get canceled or work through, um, you, you start working through backlogs. Backlogs are not in a strong place right now, now sitting at a 40 percentage point reading from the latest uh, PMI showing that those are now starting to get worked down as well. Yeah, and it's, it's unfortunate that a lot of people wait until something happens to say, okay, yeah. <laughs> this is happening. But uh, yeah, that's that's definitely a thing. And I, I wanted to pull up this chart, but we don't have time. But the economists are finally starting to agree with us that next year, go ahead, pull it up real quick. We only got 30 <laughs> seconds. This is the Philly Fed sentiment over, are we going to have a recession or not? That spike at the end is basically all of them coming to say, yes, we're about to have one, except it's still below 50%. So over half of them still think, yeah. that we're not going to be in a recession in the next few quarters. However, I, I don't know. They're really bad at predicting, too, if you look at that chart. <laughs> yeah, and I think one of the big things that they're not talking about enough is how strong the U.S. dollar is right now and yeah. what that could potentially do to imports and how that could throw everything off. But let's talk about it next week. Thanks for watching, everybody.